I'm going to read from the book of Romans, chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. I was uh, looking at a book by R.T. Kendall, uh, and there's a quote at the beginning of a chapter from a television pastor who says, there is nothing so unkind as to remind the lost of their situation. Whereas, in fact, I think we would argue that there is nothing kinder than to remind the lost of their situation. So the heading, the added heading in my Bible here says, the righteous shall live by faith. No, sorry, it doesn't say that at all. It says God's wrath on unrighteousness. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible, invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonouring of their bodies amongst themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creatures rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonourable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do whatever ought not to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Quite chilling last few words in our modern day and age. So, Paul uses a Greek equivalent of this phrase, pleasing aroma, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 1 to 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. As what? As a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God a fragrant offering, a pleasing aroma. So, although we're looking at the burnt offerings this morning, God no longer requires burnt offerings from us because of the sacrifice of Christ, who gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But again, as we mentioned last time, uh, when we think about this burnt offering, the fact that it is all consumed 
that it's all given up, then we must give ourselves up entirely to Christ. We must give everything that we have entirely to Christ in order for it to be a pleasing aroma to God. So that's the first offering, the burnt offering. We've done that in more detail than we will do the others. But the second offering is the grain offering that we read about in chapter 2. I'm not going to go through this in detail. But there's an interesting thing to note about the grain offering. There is no blood shed. There is no blood shed for sins with the grain offering and the sense is that it was often an offering that was made alongside another offering. Got all the details in the first part of Leviticus that you can read in your own time. So why then was the grain offering made? Well, it seems the purpose of the grain offering was to worship God and to acknowledge his provision, to give thanks for all that God has provided. What have we got today? What have you got today? Is it a car? Is it a house? Is it nothing more than the clothes that you stand up in? Well, are you sufficiently thankful to God for all that he has given you? And the demonstration of that in Leviticus was to bring this grain offering, to recognize that all that we have is given to us by God and to demonstrate that recognition by giving an offering back to him. Are we sufficiently thankful? The third offering in chapter 3 is the peace offering. And there are various interpretations of this. And again, you can read the detail. But essentially, it's about establishing communion, contact, connection, fellowship between the person and the Lord. We just said about the grain offering that there's no bloodshed. That's what was different about it. What is different about the peace offering? Well, as you read through chapter 3, you will see that it's the only offering where the one who is offering it shares in it. It is the only one where the person who brings the offering gets to have some of it. But the fat of the offering, again, is reserved for the one most worthy. The blood is reserved for that being that symbol for atonement. It's a way of people coming to God and saying, thank you, I am so pleased to be in a right relationship with you. A couple of minutes ago, I talked about all the things that you might have. And I talked then about material things. But what are the most valuable things? What's the most valuable thing that we have? If you talk to most people out there, they'll say, oh, your health. That's actually what people value, isn't it? Well, we've got... I've got me health, or I haven't got me health, depending on that person. But what should be most valuable to us? It should be our relationship to God, 
through the Lord Jesus Christ. How grateful are we for that relationship? What is the first thing that we think about when we get up in the morning? I suspect in my case it's a bowl of all bran. What should be our first thought in the morning? It should be thankfulness for what Christ has done for us. These people in the Old Testament brought an offering to demonstrate their thankfulness to God, that he was their God and that they were his people. So let's move on. Uh, three down, two to go. A sin offering. This is in chapter 4. What is unusual about the sin offering? Well, if you read chapter 4, it seems that there is a focus there on unintentional sins. There is a focus there on unintentional sins. And you might think, well, if it's unintentional, how can it be a sin? And I was thinking about that, and what came to mind was killing somebody. If you deliberately kill somebody, that is called murder, and you will go to jail for it for a long time. If you unintentionally kill somebody, that is called manslaughter. And you are still likely to go to prison for it. Not deliberate, not intentional, but it still has consequences and there is still punishment for it. And the same applies here. And so when we look at the sin offering, we see it is an offering for unintentional sins. Notice it's not about unintentional consequences. So, for example, it's not about, and we've all done this, trying to help and making something worse. I don't think uh, that it's about that, because we've all tried to help and make things worse. But it is a consequence of our fallen state. It is a consequence of our fallen state and the fact that that makes us do things without thinking. That sometimes we have a default setting that makes us do something that is wrong. Sometimes it's through ignorance. And that's why we read the passage from Romans. Because as is the case in the English law, ignorance is no defence. And in fact, Paul says that people should see what God has done, and that is sufficient for them not to be ignorant about God and the work of God. Sometimes we do things unintentionally because we've been reckless. I always look at Ian at this point because when we think about, not because Ian's reckless, although he has told me one or two things that he's done, uh, particularly when he was in uniform, that perhaps turned out to be a little reckless, Ian. What do you think? Uh, criminal damage. Is damage done deliberately or because of reckless behaviour? And we sometimes ignore the consequences of, th of things. We ignore the possible outcomes. And we do things that are wrong as a consequence. 
And this is something, these are things that we are all guilty of. Whether we are the people, as it says in Leviticus, or indeed the leaders of the people who get a special mention. Now, one of the things that people sometimes worry about when we think about this notion almost of unintentional sin and sort of sliding it into that notion of things that come about because of our fallen nature, what about all the things I did deliberately before I was converted? You know, the times when you got drunk or the times when you punched somebody, or the time when you stole some, something, or the time when you shouted at somebody, whatever it was. People get very anxious about those things. But we don't need to be anxious about those things if we have come to Christ and our sins have been dealt with through him. Which brings us to the fifth of our offerings, which is the guilt offering. And it's there in the scriptures, it's there in Leviticus. It is probably the most difficult one to explain and to understand. It's very like the sin offering. And it's effectively about repairing the damage done by a sin. Do you know, guilt is a major problem for many people. Many people go through their lives carrying guilt for something that has happened perhaps early on in their life. I found a website article on a therapy website. 14 reasons, 14, sorry, not reasons, 14 tips for coping with guilt. 14 tips for go coping with guilt. Not one of those 14 mentioned acknowledging your sin before God and asking for forgiveness. That is the way to deal with guilt. Do you remember what David said in the Psalms against you? Against you, O oh Lord, on, only you have I sinned. So if you're one of these people who's carrying that burden of guilt from earlier in your life, then be clear that the way to deal with that guilt is to acknowledge what you've done before God, seek his forgiveness through Christ, and be freed from that guilt. And don't forget, no matter what you have done, no matter who you have wronged, the greater offence is that given to God. Of course, we should always try and make amends with people if we have sinned against them. Can't always do that, and it may not always be accepted or wanted. But that greater offence against God can always, always be dealt with. So that's a very quick run through these five offerings at the beginning of Leviticus. Quite a complex system. Different sacrifices, different procedures, different rites for different things. Sometimes we get into a very simplistic way of thinking and sometimes that's helpful. But sometimes it's right to see that things can be a bit more complicated than that and that we have to break things down and we have to address different issues in different ways. So that's the sort of five offerings. What about 
the history of offerings in the Old Testament and what we can learn about God from it. Again, last time we mentioned that God gave the law to the people in his own time. And at this point, at the beginning of Leviticus, was a key point in the coming of the law. We saw that the tabernacle was complete. We saw at the end of Exodus 10 that, sorry, we, we, we saw at the, uh, sorry, we saw the tabernacle completed at the end of Exodus. We saw the Ten Commandments given to Mount Sinai in Exodus 20. Different points where God brings into being different aspects of his law and of the arrangements that he was making. And actually, the way Leviticus is written, it's clear, and what we see from other scriptures makes it clear as well, that bringing offerings was clearly an existing practice. When you bring an offering, do this. Not bring an offering and do this, which would suggest the beginning of something, but when you bring an offering, do this. And we talked last time about this notion of acknowledgement and bringing offerings to people and uh, the Queen of Sheba. Bringing offerings to Solomon for those who don't remember that. I read an interesting, another interesting article that compared the delivery of the law, especially that as it regards to sacrifices, as being like learning a language. So, when Ali's new baby is a little bit older, hopefully it will start to speak. And it will start with the usual words, mama, dada, and all of those things. And for a while, of course, when it's hungry, it will cry. It will not, tomorrow, say, I say, mother, do you not think it is time for the transference of sustenance from you to me? No. Language builds up, doesn't it? And we learn it and it develops. And the analogy is that the system of sacrifices in the Old Testament starts off very simply and builds up. And we see that through uh, Genesis and Exodus. So, for example, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21, we see that Adam and Eve, seeing they were naked, were clothed with animal skins. Where did those animal skins come from to clothe Adam and Eve? They came from animals. So to cover up the nakedness, to cover up the sin committed by Adam and Eve, animals had to be sacrificed. We see also, and this plays in later on, that Adam and Eve were then exiled from the presence of God. They are sent out of the Garden of Eden. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. And there's a figure with a flaming sword to prevent them coming back in. In Genesis chapter 4, we see that Cain and Abel brought offerings to God. And one was acceptable and the other was not. In Genesis chapter 8, we see after the flood, Noah brings offerings to God. We see in Genesis 22, the whole episode of Abraham and Isaac 
and the ram that was sacrificed. And we see Moses making offerings at Sinai in Exodus 24. Can you see the pattern of development there? Each time, it seems, we get a bit more detail and the process gets a little, little more sophisticated. And then we get to Leviticus and we see the full expression of the sacrificial system up to that point. That point not being the end point of the sacrificial system, the end point, end point the fulfilment of it, coming in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Alexander Pope was a 17th century poet and he wrote this know then thyself presume not god to scam the proper study of mankind is man well we don't agree with that do we it seems to me that the proper study of man is god and so as we look at this sacrificial system brought to a particular point at the beginning of Levit Leviticus, what can we learn about God from the giving of that sacrificial system? And I really struggled with this at this point because there's an awful, awful lot that you could say. I'm going to just limit myself to three things. The first one is this. God is an angry God. God is an angry God. Remember that word, propitiation? Appeasing somebody who is angry? God is an angry God. In that same book by Kendall that I mentioned earlier, he says, the fear of God is a no-nonsense, no-joking thing. Why is God angry? God hates sin. God hates those things that are contrary to his will. God is angry at sin. And sadly, for those that who do not have faith in Christ, that leads to condemnation. As well as our reading from Romans, we read in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul's talking about those out there, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Jesus in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7 tells us to flee from the wrath of God. For those who do not trust in Christ, the wrath of God leads to condemnation. For those who do trust in Christ, there is forgiveness and there is also discipline. In this context, the offerings that we see in Leviticus are a statement of faith, a recognition that God has been wronged and is rightly angry and that there needs to be Propitiation. God is an angry God. Angry at what? Angry at sin. But secondly, we see that God is a merciful God. 
he is an angry God and his anger needs to be assuaged. But he has made provision in Christ for that penalty to be paid. And these instructions in Leviticus are given to provide reassurance to his people that their sins would be forgiven and that their fellowship with him could be restored. It is a sign that God is an angry God, but it is also a sign that God is a merciful God. And then thirdly, it's a sign that God is a discerning God. God is a God who has chosen his people. In the Old Testament, God's people are characterized as Israel, and in the New Testament, characterized as the church. In both cases, it means those who have faith and acknowledge their position before him. God is discerning. He has chosen for himself a people, and these things in Leviticus were put in place for his people at that time. Again, remembering that admonition to the Pharisees that it's the heart that counts, not the ritual. And God is also a discerning God in recognising the different needs that there were, the different purposes that there were, and the requirement for different offerings to address those different needs and purposes. So not just one kind of offering to cover everything, although we had the burnt offering as a sort of fallback for that, but different offerings to reflect different circumstances and different purposes. And so, as we look at the law, the offerings that God had provided for in Leviticus, we see that God is an angry God, that he is a merciful God, and that he is a discerning God, a God who has made provision for his people. So that takes us through the first, gosh, one morning, five chapters of Leviticus. There's much more there. Do go and read it for yourselves. But we're going to finish with our last song, O Lord our God, how majestic is your name.